In previous lectures, we've talked about the difference between bilateral and unilateral contracts. And so within the topic of agreement, indeed the final mini lecture on this topic of agreement, we're going to look and bring together some special rules that are applicable to unilateral contracts. So let's just refresh our memories as to what it is that is uh, distinct about a unilateral contract. Because the objective today is to understand both the nature of a unilateral contract as well as the special rules applicable to it. So what is it essentially that makes something a unilateral contract? Well, the definition arises from what is being exchanged. The things that are being exchanged in a unilateral contract are a promise being exchanged for an act. So in the classic example, which we looked at in the previous mini lecture, Carlyle and Carbolic Smoke Ball Company, a promise was made by the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. It was a promise that they would pay a sum of money if anyone did an act, that is, use their carbolic smoke ball and caught influenza, caught the flu. That distinguishes the contract from a bilateral contract, which would be an exchange of promises, where I promise to pay you a sum of money for your car and you promise to deliver the car to me on a particular date. Now, from the example we've used, Carlyle, you'll see that a frequent feature of unilateral contracts is that the offer is made to many people. If the classic example of a unilateral contract is a reward case, of which you can think of Carlyle as a type of reward case, but if you think of a, a more typical reward case, say, I've lost property and I offer reward for the return of my lost property. The nature of the contract is that I want to motivate as many people as possible to look for it. And so I will want to give the maximum publicity to my offer. I want many people to hear it so that many people are motivated to go and look for my lost property. But publication of the offer to many people is a frequent, but it is not a necessary feature of a unilateral contract. A unilateral contract might exist where one party makes a promise to one other party only. If I lose my property and I happen to say to someone I know who's very good at finding things, if you find my property, I will pay you this sum of money. It's just as much a unilateral contract because it is an exchange of a promise for an act, even though it is only addressed to one person. Well, the first special rule we're going to look at is one that we've mentioned already, which is about advertisements. Because we can't generalise whether an advertisement is more likely to be an invitation to treat or is more likely to amount to a contractual offer. But we can generalise a little if we can ascertain whether the advertisement is proposing a unilateral contract or is proposing a bilateral contract. Because the case we've mentioned already, the classic case on unilateral contracts, Carlyle and Carbolic Smoke Ball Company, is authority for saying that where the advertisement proposes a unilateral contract, that advertisement is more likely to be considered as an offer. Now the next special rule deals with the communication of revocation. Because a unilateral offer may be revoked 
if the revocation is given equivalent publicity to the offer. Well, why is that special? Well, it's special because revocation may be effective in relation to a unilateral offer, even if it is not actually communicated to the offeree. So, this special rule is an exception to the general rule that revocation of an offer must be communicated to the offeree. So, the law is full of propositions and exceptions, and you have to be careful that you can always distinguish the proposition from the exception. The general proposition is that revocation is only effective upon communication. We dealt with that in a previous mini-lecture. But in relation to a unilateral contract, there is an exception where revocation may be effective without actual communication if the revocation is given equal publicity to the original offer. And surprisingly, it's an American case, not a UK case, that is authority for this quite sensible proposition. I say quite sensible because you can imagine if in that typical case, which I've already described of a unilateral offer, you publicise the offer to as many people as possible, you can never be sure when you, the offeror, seek to revoke it that you can make every single recipient of the offer aware of the revocation. So we need a practical mechanism. And it is surprising that UK law hasn't had to address that uh, before now. But what happened in Shuey against the US is that the US Supreme Court held that an offer of a reward for information leading to the arrest of certain criminals was revoked by a presidential decree. There was no requirement or indeed any realistic possibility that the revocation would be communicated to every person who read the original offer. Rather, it was enough to quote the case that the same notoriety be given to the revocation that was given to the offer. So, translating that to our jurisdiction, if I made an offer in a national newspaper, I don't think you could say that if I then revoked that offer by putting a smaller ad in a local newspaper, I would be giving the same notoriety to the uh, offer. Same notoriety to the revocation that I gave to the offer. Our final special rule is about revocation and part performance. And this is a particular problem we have because revocation can sometimes be attempted by a unilateral offeror after the offeree has begun performance of the act that is stipulated. Now, if I offered a sum of money as a reward to my student who ran 40 times round uh, my, the law faculty building, if on the 39th lap, just as they're coming to complete the final circuit, I shouted, I revoke. I think we have an instinctive sense of the injustice that would follow. So that does give us a challenge. And you could see it in a more serious context in Errington and Errington. Because a father told his son and daughter, so his son and daughter-in-law, that if they made the mortgage payments on a house he'd bought, a house he'd bought with the aid of a mortgage, the house would become theirs. They made these payments, and after the father died, the personal representative of the 
uh, estate of the father, tried to revoke the promise that was made by the father. But it was held it could not be revoked. Now that is sometimes overstated because students will write this in exams every year and say, that in the case of a unilateral contract, you can never revoke the offer once performance of the stipulated act has begun. It was decided that on the facts of Errington and Errington, there could be no revocation, but it was not the propos correct proposition of law to say that there never can be revocation in a unilateral contract. And that is because this rule that you can't revoke depends upon the implication of a term. It is only the case that you cannot revoke a unilateral offer once performance of the stipulated act has begun. It is only the case that you can't revoke when a term is implied to that effect. And that term will usually be implied, but won't always be implied. And the example of the case where it was not implied is Luxor and Cooper. Because in Luxor and Cooper, the owner of a cinema, two cinemas, offered an agent £10,000 if the agent introduced a purchaser to whom the owner sold his cinemas. The agent introduced a buyer, prepared to pay the asking price, but the owner declined to sell. Now the case went all the way to the House of Lords with the agent trying to claim uh, his commission but the House of Lords held that the owner could revoke the promise to pay commission there was no need to imply a term that the owner could not revoke that promise once the offeree the agent had begun performance, i.e. had tried to find and successfully found someone prepared to buy the cinemas. Why is this so? Well, the test for the implication of a term is said to be one of business efficacy. We can imply a term into a contract when it is needed to give business effectiveness to that contract. But there was no need to imply such a term here to give business effectiveness to the contract. And that arises from the fact that a huge amount of money was being given for a relatively small task. The £10,000 in 1941, the House of Lords noticed, was more than the, the salary of the Lord Chancellor for a whole year. Now, if an agent was being offered a sum of money to do a small task of finding purchasers for more than a whole year of the most senior judge's salary, it was said that you don't need to imply a term saying that the endeavours of the agent can be frustrated by the owner simply declining to go through with the offer. Because it will, so much is at stake, it is always worthwhile the agent trying to find the people to buy in the event or in the hope that the owner won't change his mind. So Luxor and Cooper is the highest authority for saying that it is not always the case that a term will be implied to the effect that the unilateral offeror will not revoke once the offeror Offeree has begun performance of the stipulated act. Now, as a bit of extra reading, I've suggested you read Luxor and Cooper because it's a case that students often have difficulty with, but it is proof of the proposition and proof of the high from the highest court that not every unilateral offer is accompanied by an implied promise that it will not be revoked once the offeree has begun performance of the stipulated act. And I would suggest you read the case and or a discussion of the case in the online module or in McKendrick, uh, paragraph 330. Okay, thank you very much.